So my name is Daniel Lachlan. I'm an associate professor at the Botany Department at the University of Wyoming. The potential to make positive change and restore degraded ecosystems is really what drove me to uh, study plants and the restoration of um, plants and vegetation. And really, but to, to do that well, you need to understand the fundamental ecology of these systems. So um, that's what really motivates me. In restoration ecology, we're in a bit of an existential crisis because we're trying to restore historical conditions, but conditions are rapidly changing. So we need a new approach to restoration. And my approach is to look at um, trying to restore functionality in ecosystems and viewing that through the lens of the functional traits of the species, which are the properties of species that influence their function. And so we try to optimize um, species assemblages to meet sort of functions like productivity or drought tolerance or invasion resistance. The most re rewarding moments in my career have been uh, seeing my graduate students develop um, from um, you know shy uh, introverted students into very deep thinking uh, students who have made an impact on the field of ecology. So seeing them develop and graduate and move on to other positions has been the most rewarding part of my career. Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so today we have the honor of having Daniel Laughlin visit. Um, he came down from University of Wyoming and spent the day, I scheduled his day such that he would have absolutely no breaks. So he's exhausted, dehydrated, so we're going to see how he does in the talk. So we can get the feedback in the end and this is his endurance. Um, so Daniel, um, I'll give you a little bit of his history. Um, as much as I know it, he grew up um, around the Pittsburgh area and then quickly realized that um, Michigan would be a much better place to live and hang out. I'm from Michigan. Um, so he went to Calvin College to get his bachelor's degree, which is in Grand, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, went back. I don't know what this says about Michigan. He went back to Pennsylvania for his master's degree at Penn State University. Then he went to Northern Arizona University. He worked for the Ecological Restoration, <laughs> the Ecological Restoration Institute there and got his PhD there at NAU. Then was a professor at University of Waikato in uh, New Zealand. And then in 2017, is that right? Yeah. Um, got the position at University of Wyoming. So he's joined us here in the front range. And, uh, and yeah, we're super excited to have Daniel in the area. And uh, he's kind of community ecologist, ecophysiologist, restoration ecologist, uh, person of many, many trades, I guess. So um, he's going to talk with us some about his research. So join me in welcoming Daniel to, to the department. Well, thank you very much, Troy, for the invitation. And thank you all for coming out today. So what I'd like to talk to you all about today is my interest in trying to make community ecology more predictive, but not just to improve the theory of ecology, but actually to use those um, theoretical frameworks to make, um, make advances in applying that field to uh, restore degraded ecosystems. So my talk will really be in two parts. So the first half of the talk will be to describe a framework that links four things, species pools, the functional traits of the species in that pool, environmental filters, and then species interactions. And integrating those in order to predict species abundances across environmental gradients. And then I'm going to shift gears to apply the framework in order to try to develop species assemblages to try to achieve some functional outcome uh, in restoring uh, degraded ecosystems. So the first place I'd like to start with is what I consider to be the fundamental unit of community ecology, the species list. So a lot of us who got interested in ecology and evolution, might have, their interest might have been sparked by maybe going on a walk uh, with the Audubon Society and listing all the species of birds that you found or saw or heard that morning. Or maybe you're uh, a fisherman and you were fishing in the North Platte and you come back and tell your partner all the different species uh, and their lengths and sizes of the fish uh, that you caught that day. So whether or not you're studying plants or birds or fish or mammals, all of us are familiar with this concept of a species list, which includes the species that you see in any particular site and maybe the abundances of those species. 
It's something that's very familiar, but it's also probably been one of the most difficult things to be able to predict uh, at any point in time or space. So it's sort of vexed the field of community ecology. It's a, it's a very difficult vector uh, of, of interest, uh, a very difficult thing to predict. So the challenge of making this prediction can be illustrated here. So here we have on the left is the beautiful country um, Aotearoa, or New Zealand. Um, which we know has a couple thousand native species that occur within that confined continental island. But if you go to any particular point on that island, you'll see that only a few species actually are coexisting in one spot. So the filters that exist are so strong that you can go from a couple thousand species down to um, a few species within, say, um, uh, your plot. So how do you make that prediction? So as a community ecologist, I like to think of us as really just wanting to have a conversation with Banquo. You know, he wants to talk about which grain will grow and which will not. And so we're all just trying to have uh, spin a yarn with Banquo. So how do we frame this concept of going from a species pool to a local community? So I'll describe um, now a general framework, a common framework that we currently um, uh, are working in in the field of community ecology, especially trait-based community ecology. And that's where we start from the unfiltered regional species pool. So if you look at the top of this graph, uh, each of those symbols represents a species. Um, and this species pool can increase through speciation events or through immigration, or the species pool can decline through extinction events or emigration. The first filters um, that we want to talk about are the, 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 the abiotic drivers that really drive the distribution of, of species across the landscape. So you can think of uh, drought as a strong filter or cold uh, uh, or freezing tolerance as a strong filter. So if you go from the left to the right of this arrow that represents this environmental gradient, what we'll see is that the light colored species will be filtered out on this side of the gradient and then the dark colored species will be filtered out on this side of the gradient. And then once we get down into these filtered pools, then sort of local processes take over, such as dispersal into certain plots, maybe just demographic um, uh, mortality events occurring in that plot, uh, a recruitment event, or maybe some of that mortality is driven by competitive exclusion. So there's two dominant processes we want to talk about. Abiotic filtering based on the tolerance or physiological tolerance of species to the site. And secondly, species interactions, because both of these are occurring simultaneously to determine what species from the regional pool can be found in a local community. So the problem with this model, even though it makes sense, most people agree that it's a good conceptual model, is that it makes no specific predictions in any particular place, right? So I'm very interested in trying to translate this concept into a mathematical framework that actually can be uh, make actual predictions in real communities using data that we typically collect. So what would a successful model look like? Well, at its, in its barest bones, the model should be able to take a list of species that occur in the regional species pool, have some information about their traits that tell us something about their phenotype and how they're adapted to certain conditions, and then be able to predict their abundances along that gradient. So that's the, really the central goal. Uh, and you'll see that the three components there are the species, their traits, and the environment. So the first model that was developed to, to try to meet this challenge was Shipley's uh, CATS model, or the Community Assembly by Trait Selection. And so I'll describe it geometrically, but uh, it's really a system of linear equations. So let's just think about this in terms of trying to predict the abundances of three species. So three species abundances, we can try to illustrate that in three dimensions. Okay, so each of these axes represents the abundances of, of each species. Well, the first thing we want to do is just say, let all the abundances sum to one. And that's the first constraint equation. And if you let their abundances sum to one, then all the solutions would just fall in this triangular plane. Okay, so we've reduced the dimensionality of the problem down to all of 
uh, dimensions in three uh, in three dimensions down to a single triangular plane within this space. The second equation we want to consider is actually uh, brings the ecology into the model. And that says that the linear combination of these abundances and their traits is equal to some value. So what, what, are, these, what are these values? So the values on the left are the trait values of each species, and they're attached to these unknown species abundances. Their products and the sum of their products equals this value here, which I'm going to call the optimal trait value. Okay? This is actually the calculation of a community weighted mean. So one of the assumptions in this model is that the optimal trait value can be estimated by knowing something about what the average trait value is in that community, weighted by the abundance of these species. Once you do that, then all the solutions fall on a single line. Okay, but a line is still an infinite number of solutions on that line, so you have to pick one. And the way they picked one is to just choose the maximum likelihood solution, which is the one that optimizes the Shannon diversity um, index. Okay, so we've learned a lot from this model. We've applied it in many different systems, trying to predict, you know, we're trying to understand which traits are most predictive of community assemblages. And uh, we looked at a variety of different uh, ecosystems where this could be applied. Um, and we found uh, this very general pattern here. The first thing you should see from this is that, oh, the x-axis, if you can't see it, is in the number of traits in the model, and the y-axis is the predictive power of the model for explaining community assemblages. If you increase a few traits in the model, you see this increasing uh, ability to predict community um, assemblages which uh, really relates to the idea that you need multiple traits to that describe uh, leaf physiology, root physiology, uh, flowering phenology, uh, in order to really capture all the functions that are, um, uh, in, that are occurring in that ecosystem. But it quickly levels off, and that's because if you've ever studied traits, you know that many traits are highly correlated, and so they're redundant, and so they yield sort of a diminishing returns in their information content. Okay, so multiple traits increases our ability to predict, um, predict vegetation composition. But this framework has some limitations. So the first, that it's, it was really criticized highly in the literature when it came out, uh, because some people said, well, you need to observe these community-weighted mean trait values in the community to make the prediction in the community. And that's a fair argument. Um, but, it, at, but at the same time, it's, very, it's also been shown that this model is just a special case of Poisson regression. So if you ever fit a regression um, and you use that argument, then you're saying that your regression model is also circular because you have observed and predicted values. So I don't think it's a strong argument that it's circular, um, but it does, you know, the question still remains, how do we define those optimal trait values? And that's a really interesting question. Another thing, it uses only average trait values per species. It doesn't incorporate intraspecific trait variation, which has been shown to be quite significant. Um, but do remember this approach because we're going to go back to it later because it's a nice simple approach that we can apply in applied um, systems um, in restoration. But I'd like to uh, think more now about how do we incorporate this variation within species um, that has been shown to be important by evolutionary uh, biologists for, for many, many decades. So uh, the question here is how do we link this variation in traits to fitness, because that's really the ultimate goal. Because if we can link traits to fitness, then we can make generalizable predictions. Well, here's the classic sort of fitness function along a trait gradient. So within a certain environment, the idea is that there's one, that there's one value that optimizes fitness, and it declines on either side. But if you look at this across an environmental gradient, then what we see is that the, the peak in that trait should shift along the trait axis as you go across an environmental gradient. So this is the kind of information that we want to, or this idea, this concept that we want to translate into, um, into a statistical model. And the way we're going to do this is to use um, what I've called the likelihood approach, which is basically 
uh, rooted in the idea that you can build a regression model between traits and the environment. So say you do that, say you measure a trait along an environmental gradient and you fit a regression model to that. Well, what that regression model tells you is that the mean value of the trait is a function of the environment and that there's some probability distribution or likelihood function um, within each environment. So we can zero in on, say, the third environment here and we would say that um, organisms that have this trait value would be most likely to occur in that particular environment. This is fundamentally uh, the, the approach we use in uh, the trait space model which we developed um, a few years ago. So this model assumes that species abundances are determined by the trait values that they express in the environment that they're trying to establish it. Okay, And so here we have a depiction of this trait environment relationship, this regression model here. And so if we wanted to make a prediction of what species would occur in a particular environment, we would use this regression model like this. We would say, okay, let's zero in on one particular location in the environment. And what we see based on this regression is that there's a constricted range of trait values that are viable or most likely to occur within that particular environment. If uh, then we superimpose on that trait distributions for these six different species, we would see that this yellow and green species, they're overlapping this trait filter the most. And so a successful model would say, well, the probability of that yellow and green species would be highest, would be higher than the other species there. Okay, uh, I'm going to go gloss over the details of this model, but essentially we quantify trait distributions for all species. And then we quantify the environmental filters using a, a linear regression model approach. And the, what we're really interested in is this value here, the probability of each species given the environment. So first we use Bayes' rule to invert these likelihoods into probabilities. And then we use Monte Carlo integration to integrate the traits out, but recognizing that the traits are doing all of the work for making these predictions. So the first system we had sort of tested this model in uh, was a nice uh, system in, in Arizona where we go from pinyon juniper woodland through ponderosa pine forest, Douglas fir, and up into Engelmann spruce and even bristlecone pine on the tops of the San Francisco peaks. So a broad climatic gradient um, with a ver relatively small species pool, there are 9 to 15 tree species that really grow along this gradient. So the first thing we do in this model is we fit the species trait distributions. So here I'm showing a three-dimensional plot where each color represents a species um, and where each species occurs within this trait space. So I'm focusing on three species, specific leaf area, uh, wood density, and bark thickness. Okay. Um, so I'm going to focus on wood density and bark thickness since these would be uh, very important traits for predicting species assemblages um, along this system. So that's the first step. The second step is to think about the environmental filters. So I mentioned that wood density was important. Wood density is important because it's been shown to be correlated with P50 or this trait that uh, gives us some information about the drought tolerance or the resistance to drought induced cavitation. Um, it's not, the wood density isn't a perfect correlate of P50, but it's uh, reasonable if you don't have P50 data. Bark thickness is another really important trait because in surface fire systems, the mortality rate decreases, um, uh, in, decreases with increasing bark thickness because it prevents the cambium from, from dying in a surface fire. Okay. So we know these, well, from theory, we know these traits should be important. So do they correlate with the environmental gradient? And they do. So here's wood density variation along a mean annual temperature gradient. The hottest, driest environments are dominated by species with quite dense wood. Uh, in the most favorable environments, wood density is lowest. But then it increases again where mean annual temperature is about zero. And I think that's due to freezing-induced cavitation or, or tolerance to freezing-induced cavitation. Uh, bristlecone pine is actually quite a dense wooded species. 
Bark thickness increased exponentially with increasing mean annual temperature because surface fires, uh, the, the mean uh, the interval for fires uh, was, was quite um, short. So lots more fires in these hotter uh, environments. So how did the model perform once we link these two sources of information together? Well, quite well. So here's the observed relative abundances of these species along the gradient. And these are the predicted uh, uh, predicted abundances along the environmental gradient. Um, so the correlation is uh, well an R squared of 0.44. Another way of looking at their correlation is just by looking at the observed temperature optimum for a species and the predicted temperature optimum. And what we can see is the line, it falls pretty much on the one to one line. So I want to take a brief digression here to talk about the the, the basis of this likelihood approach, this assumption that linking traits to the environment is that a valid approach for thinking about how traits influence fitness. Um, so we tested this idea using demographic information. So rather than just linking traits as a function of the environment, a stronger test of this idea is to actually test whether a vital rate is a function of a trait by environment interaction. In other words, we're asking, does the effect of a trait on some vital rate depend on what the environmental context is? So a significant trait by environment interaction is really important for telling us whether a trait has fitness effects. So here's an example of flowering date, average flowering date across a sand content gradient. So species that flowered later um, are, tend to be more common in droughtier soils which fits a lot of observations that we see uh, around here. So testing that required some survival data. So, um, and what this shows, what this interaction surface shows, is that in where sand content is low, the av the early, um, on average, species tended to be more early flowering. And this ref is reflected in the sign of this slope. It's a negative sign uh, at low sand content. And this interaction surface flips from a negative sign to a positive sign because of the significant interaction. So in, in sandy soils, species tend to flower later, and that is shown in the survival probabilities as well. So this sort of tells us that this method um, is, is useful. But there are circumstances where these results differ, and this is where um, you have to question whether or not the average trait value is helpful in that circumstance. We're moving into not just looking at individual vital rates, but actually integrating all these vital rates uh, using population models, where we look at growth, survival, and reproduction. And what I'm really interested in is not just looking at individual vital rates, but actual fitness or population growth rates, and seeing how traits influence population growth rates along environmental gradients. I think that is probably one of the strongest tests of whether traits will improve our predictive generality in ecology. OK, so so far, I have totally ignored biotic interactions. Right? I focused exclusively on abiotic filtering. But this is a very nice, um, highly cited figure for um, showing our conceptual framework in community assembly. And biotic interactions are the second filter uh, that species go through, okay, uh, in order to go from the regional species pool down to a local community. So ignoring it can be potentially quite fatal, right? It's, it, but it, was, it took a while for us to find the time to figure out how to integrate these two sort of um, frameworks. And the way we started to integrate species interactions, we took a very classical approach. Okay, so we used Locke Volterra models in order to do this. So here's a single species uh, logistic growth curve where its growth is eventually limited uh, by its carrying capacity. We can generalize this to multi species uh, systems. And the way we do that is by adding these coefficients, these, these competition coefficients. And if we solve the species abundances at equilibrium, there's actually a nice simple equation here where the abundances of the species are a function of the interaction coefficients and their carrying capacities. Okay? So how do we link the Locke-Volterra approach to this 
trait space approach. What is the, the common currency that might link these together? Well, we're proposing that carrying capacities are the common currency that link these approaches. So carrying capacity, the classic approach, is that the number of individuals of a species uh, capable, of, 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 capable of surviving in that particular environment. And I should note, in the absence of competition, right? So uh, competitors reduce species carrying capacities uh, because they're extracting resources, assimilating those resources. So I argue that these should peak in optimal environments for the species, where both the abiotic conditions are optimal uh, and where there's no competitors, and decline in suboptimal environments. And really, if I think about the trait space framework, I have not incorporated any, any competitive interactions in this. So these probabilities that trait space is predicting vary with the environment and they should be proportional to carrying capacity. So that's the argument we're trying to make, and this is potentially the link uh, and to linking these two integrations. So, um, so the, the new approach we're calling Banquo, which is the integration of in, uh, trait space, where the environment drives what traits are viable, which then drives the carrying capacities rather than the species abundances. And if we can somehow estimate these interaction coefficients using a different set of traits that are important to competition, then we can link those two together with that equation to predict abundances along the gradient. So note that when competition is absent, this model then simply reduces down to the trait space framework. But how do traits drive competition? And this is the thing that really mm, we struggled with for, for many, many months. Um, the classic way of looking at how traits drive competition is by looking at trait differences between species. And so on this x-axis, this is the trait difference. And the y-axis, the thing we're trying to estimate are these alpha interaction coefficients, these competition coefficients. So if niche differentiation was the driving process, if species that competed the most had very similar trait values, then this is the form of the relationship that we would expect. So we would expect competition to peak where the trait difference is zero. So this is sort of the limiting similarity framework. But if this, shift, if this peak shifts along this gradient, then we have a hierarchical competition framework where, say, the, um, the species that has the larger trait value will always suppress the species with the smaller trait. And height is a good example of this in wetland systems um, where taller species uh, reduce light to smaller species. So then we use a model fitting framework to determine which, um, which sort of model makes the most sense and we uh, uh, fit it to the observed data and maximize the likelihood. Okay, so just to refresh your, um, the, to summarize this model approach, here's some real, some real perfectly simulated data um, that's very neat. So these are, would be species along an environmental gradient, species carrying capacities varying uh, systematically along this gradient. And let's just say that every other species is competitively dominant. So the orange, green, blue, and purple species are uh, competitively suppress the other species. Well, if you merge these two sources of information together, then what we have using this Banco framework is that the orange, green, blue, and purple species are competitively dominant and they suppress the other species. But note that these other species, the peaks of their location along the environmental gradient remains constant, okay? So this is on very nice, perfectly simulated data. So let's see how this framework works on some real messy data. Okay, so here we're going to uh, look at a system, an ephemeral wetland system in New Zealand. These are uh, glacial, uh, essentially glacial deposits. Uh, they're uh, depressions where you have a very strong gradient from frequently flooded, flooded in the interior of the wetland to completely dry on the, on the highest part of these kettle holes. Well, we modeled the environmental filtering using root traits, because in this system, the presence of a rinkema 
really gives you a competitive edge uh, uh, or be able to tolerate these flooded soils. So the arenchyma allows you to, make, to store oxygen in your roots so that you can continue to uh, respire. Um, and uh, gives you an edge. So root arenchyma increases with the number of the days submerged in this wetland. So that was the trait we used for modeling the filtering. And we used height as a predictor of competitive interactions. And if you fit that model that I just described, this is what uh, we basically see where species with very different height differences don't compete very often. So there's a little bit of niche differentiation occurring here, but it, in general the peak is to the right of this um, zero line, which suggests that taller species uh, generally outcompete shorter species. Okay, So it's kind of a mixture between limiting similarity and a competitive hierarchy framework. So once we merge these two sources, how did we do? So these are the observed species abundances across this flooding gradient. Lots of variation. And this is just the trait space prediction. So this is only accounting for abiotic filtering. If you squint, you can kind of see that the, the trends are, it's getting the trends right, but it's really under predicting turnover and it's um, over predicting alpha diversity. Once you incorporate competitive interactions, uh, you allow for competitive exclusion to occur in the model and the model gets a lot better. It tends to overpredict competitive exclusion, um, and but one of the things that it's doing quite well. So if you compare the observed beta and alpha diversity, it's getting the alpha diversity um, much better, and it's getting be it's getting better at incorporating how species are turning over along the gradient. The important thing is is that we were able to estimate 225 pairwise competition coefficients without any experiments. It's just using observational data uh, which uh, based on functional traits. So this I think is, is, is a, nice, um, a nice advance. Okay, part two, how do we apply this in the real world? Okay, so one of the reasons I got into ecology was my interest in restoring degraded landscapes. And when we see a degraded landscape, as ecologists who have strong senses of place, our first reaction is to try to restore what we lost on that landscape. So the natural approach to this is to try to figure out what we had historically. Okay, But historical conditions may be much less relevant today. And the reason why is because population vital rates of species, their ability to survive, their ability to regenerate, is constantly changing in response to a changing climate. Um, and there's very strong evidence for this. So we've known for about a decade now that tree mortality across the West has increased dramatically uh, over time. So we have increasing rates across regions, increasing rates across elevation zones, increasing mortality rates across size classes of trees and across many different species. And it's not just in the West. Uh, we see this uh, around the world. And um, people who are studying this have suggested that we're crossing some mortality threshold and that now the stress extremes are so frequent that this is why we're seeing this increasing mortality rates. But if we're going to see changes in species distributions across landscapes, you not only need to see the mortality changing, you also need to see recruitment probabilities changing. And there's some really interesting data uh, coming out this year about this. So this is uh, data from Matt Hurto's project in the Jemez Mountains of New Mexico. He planted eight species within the Ponderosa Pine Zone in the Jemez Mountains. And Ponderosa Pine had a horrible survivorship. None of these species really had good survivorship. But the species that did well were pinion and juniper in the zone where ponderosa pine should be dominating. This is not just the case in the southern Rockies, this is also the case in the northern Rockies. So Hansen and Turner showed that Douglas fir and lodgepole pine regeneration, their establishment success was at higher elevations than they currently occur. So this is suggesting um, all across the west that species recruitment events um, are shifting uh, with uh, shifting climates.
This is a bit of an existential problem, I would say, for restoration ecology. We have thought so long about basing restoration targets on historical conditions. But if we do that, it's ultimately going to lead to failure based on some of these preliminary results. So we need a new framework for trying to figure out how do we restore ecological communities in a time of constant change. And I think functional ecology or linking ecophysiology to community ecology is really the logical place to start. To thinking about which species will succeed and which will uh, be losers. Okay? So, how do we do this? So, historically, we would uh, want to sit down and figure out what the desired future conditions are for a site. And we would do so by looking at natural and documentary archives. We'd look at uh, 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 fig to figure out exactly what species occurred historically, and that species assemblage would be something that we would want uh, to restore. But what if we want to restore something that is going to be resilient to the future? Well, based on projected forecasts of increasing drought, maybe increasing fire frequencies. Well, we would just have to ask ourselves a question. Why were those species there historically? Well, presumably they were there because they had the traits or the phenotypes that optimized their fitness in those historical conditions. So if we can somehow map the traits of the species to the future projected forecasts, then perhaps we'll have greater success. And we do that by setting trait-based objectives and using these modeling frameworks to determine what species um, would match those trait-based objectives. So what I actually am saying here is we can actually view historical ecosystems through the lens of functional traits as well. So really the historical approach is really just a special case of a more general class of objectives for restoration ecology um, based on functional objectives. But how do we really do this in practice? Because you don't manage traits and on the ground restoration is manipulating individuals and species. So, um, practitioners aren't managing traits, but they're masters at manipulating species. So we need a framework that can use traits as the input and species abundances then are the output, which we then try to optimize or manage. And these modeling frameworks do it for us. So remember this system of linear equations. Well, in this case, this value on the right hand side of the equation would be the trait value to achieve a certain functional objective. If you wanted a, a, a community that's drought tolerant, you would want the average value of that community to be on the, on the end of the drought tolerance spectrum. Okay? And so this is the framework we would use to do it. Uh, I have not been able, I have not yet incorporated species interactions to this framework, but that's sort of a, a future ongoing project. So what would this look like? Well, here are some familiar figures. Uh, let's consider what this might look like using this framework in a mixed conifer forest. Well, say we have increasing drought and increasing fire frequency. We would want traits to optimize drought tolerance and to optimize fire resistance. And we've shown that wood density and bark thickness are reasonable traits to start thinking about uh, this in the context of restoration. So if we go to a mixed conifer forest in Arizona, we would come across um, a standard list of species. And if we were to reconstruct the, hist the, the conditions of the forest using dendrochronological techniques, we would find that ponderosa pine tended to dominate. These would be warm, mi warm mixed conifer forest, warm dry mixed conifer forests, with a little bit of Douglas fir and uh, a little bit of white fir. Okay, so this would be the approach if we had a his purely historical approach to restoration. Well, if we take the same species pool and say, well, let's just select species that have thick bark and dense wood to optimize increasing drought tolerance and, and uh, fire resistance, then this is what the model shows us would, uh, would optimize those functions. Interestingly, it would still say ponderosa pine should be quite dominant but it increases the abundance of Douglas fir and oak, um, probably driven by uh, the dense wood. So this is not a, an unreasonable palette of species for, um, for thinking about 
uh, increasing resilience, and we do see gamble oak increasing dramatically across the Colorado landscape in response to fire, um, and it's quite drought tolerant. But what if we thought more broadly and said, not just thinking about the species that are currently in that forest, but opening it up to species that we think might be expanding into that forest. And we know in the Jemez Mountains that pinyon and juniper have high recruitment rates in the Ponderosa Pine Zone. So if we expand the species pool in this model, we actually see that pinyon and juniper are, are selected for in this modeling framework. So this is a, an assemblage of species that don't currently exist uh, in uh, contemporary ecosystems. Uh, maybe there's some actually interesting places in the Sky Islands of, of Arizona where it does, but, but these would be considered a no analog assemblage. And I think we need to think broadly in restoration and not fear the no analog assemblage. We need to sort of uh, open up our arms to species that occur in slightly other environments. We first absolutely must start with the native species pool because we already have a, a variety of adaptable species in the native species pool. But we just shouldn't limit it to that. We should think broadly about how species might be moving in the future. So we want to test these ideas. And one way of testing this is in experimental grasslands. And uh, so we're starting a project with Jennifer Funk and Dana Blumenthal, uh, where we want to test these ideas in two very different systems. So one in a grassland system in California, and then another in the mixed grass of Wyoming. And uh, as an example for optimizing drought tolerance in the serpentine grassland, for example, um, we would optimize two trout, say uh, two traits, water use efficiency, we would really want high maximum values of water use efficiency in this community to maximize drought tolerance. But there are other traits that we don't really want high or low values. We want to optimize the diversity of those traits. And rooting depth is one of those. Because if you can optimize the diversity of rooting depth, you're actually increasing the complementarity of these communities because water is distributed vertically throughout the soil profile. So you want species that are um, extracting soil water from both shallow and deep portions of the soil. Uh, and so now we can optimize functional diversity and not just Simpson's evenness in this approach. And in the Wyoming mixed grass prairie, um, we want to develop uh, um, uh, species mixtures and test whether or not they're invasion resistant and uh, whether or not they can be drought tolerant. And the invasion resistant traits we're thinking about are, are traits such as uh, low leaf nitrogen concentration. So it's a species that can draw down the resources to limit invasion uh, of, of um, exotic species um, uh, and species that might be able to spread vegetatively below ground. Drought tolerance traits include things like leaf osmotic potential, which are good predictors of leaf turgor loss point um, and uh, leaf dry matter content and maybe optimizing the diversity of rooting depth to maximize the complementarity of water use uptake below ground. We have a couple other sort of um, controls on this, and this is a, a, just a functionally diverse grouping uh, of species, uh, which maximizes the full functional diversity of the community, because it could be that um, in variable years, uh, if you have a diverse community, that might buffer the responses of interannual variation. Um, so we also have included a functionally diverse mix. And so we are establishing these communities this year and we'll be subjecting them to drought and invasion by cheatgrass in the coming years. Okay, so to summarize, uh, these models of environmental filtering and species interactions have now been integrated and so we can now try to predict assemblages across space um, and hopefully across time. When we select functional traits, we need to do so very critically. I think there's a dearth of, of literature right now where people are just measuring any functional trait they can and using data mining to see how they correlate with environmental gradients. And that's not going to make us uh, advance theory in trait-based ecology. Uh, we need to choose traits that have very strong ecophysiological relevance and link them to demographic rates if we really want to test their significance. And finally, I think we can use these approaches, um, hopefully, to make some headway in rethinking about how we set targets in ecological restoration. Uh, it's, I've thought about this for quite some time, and it's right now, in my mind, it's one of the best um, 
fruitful approaches for thinking about how we redefine uh, what species assemblages will meet functional objectives in the future and, and maintain relevance in a time where the UN has declared this to be the, the coming decade of ecological restoration. So thank you so much for, for your time and I'd have you to take questions. Before um, we get to the questions, Daniel, will you just repeat the question when they ask it so we can capture it on the audio on the video? You bet. Nice. Yes, Mindy. So um, in your approach, you use mean trait values. Um, and like for the example of the, the forests that you showed, you, know, that you might start getting novel species coming in. But but you're using mean trait values, you're not like thinking about, the, you're not necessarily incorporating plasticity uh, or even selection of particular traits that could potentially keep, you know, better, uh, make uh, existing species or an extant species more suitable to yeah. changing conditions. So I, I'm just curious how, uh, I'm imagining you're gonna try to incorporate that kind of stuff in the models and whether you've tried to do that and what success you've had with yeah, so the question is about can we incorporate plasticity in species responses because maybe the species could adapt to the conditions. Um, I think if I summarize that, okay. Um, yeah, so the, the trait space approach gets the closest to being able to do that because it, it takes all the trait values that we've observed in a species and then fits a distribution to those trait values. So it doesn't explicitly state that species at one end of that distribution will be selected for and maybe become more abundant, but it allows the species to have uh, variability in its trait or its phenotypic expression. So um, in some senses, it, it, it still allow, it increases the likelihood that a species that has a broader range of trait values would be uh, maybe adapted to a broader range of environmental conditions. And so it might be, it might be able to buffer that. Um, but we haven't explicitly said that, uh, or been able to um, say, fit distributions for different genotypes within the same species, which would be very possible within this framework, though. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, in the back. Yeah. So you talked about uh, how you're aiming your desired future conditions based on the environment. With things changing so rapidly, how do you kind of aim at a moving target depending yeah. on what the community is going to be like? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the question is, how do you uh, set your trait target if it's a moving target? And um, the, the way I like to think about it is the way that Don Falk talked about it at the recent Ecological Restoration Conference. It's, um, it's not that we're setting a fixed target, but we want to think about traits that might enhance the resilience of the community so that it can kind of adapt by itself. And this would differ whether or not we're restoring a grassland from scratch or whether we're manipulating the forest of the, the structure of a intact forest that might have shifted from its historical um, range of variability. So I think um, that's the way you need to start thinking about it. And the, the way I think about it in grassland in this experiment, for example, is that we project that drought is going to be uh, more uh, an important selection uh, agent. In, uh, it, it's important right now, and it might be even more important in the future. We know that in, invasive species are a problem in, in rangelands and things that um, rangeland managers are interested in. So you try to emphasize, focus on the functions that you want to achieve and then go for it. And we're going to have to adapt in, say, 10 years to um, thinking about what the next function is we want to optimize. But great question. Yeah. Uh, um, can you just talk briefly about how in the updated model um, you guys are able to estimate the pairwise competition coefficients of so many different species? Yeah, so we calculate the trait difference for each species. And in this case, there were 15 species. Um, so we calculated um, trait differences for all those species. And then fit, uh, essentially it's a model uh, optimization where we say, okay, and fit that Gaussian function to say, okay, what Gaussian function best matches the, an estimated alpha 
um, competition coefficient matrix to the observed abundances that we see in the field. So it's like a transfer function where you say, okay, we need to estimate these alpha coefficients. So we essentially optimize this Gaussian function to make the alpha coefficients such that we reproduce as close as possible to what we see in the ground. So then the idea would be to come up with some generalizable um, transfer functions for traits and how they relate to competition um, and then predict that on other sites. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't repeat the question. The question was about competition coefficients. Yeah. Now that you started to tackle competition, have you started to ponder emergent properties of black communities? In what way? Can, uh, well, I mean, a lot of the assumption seems to be that communities are the sum of their parts, but a lot of ecology would argue that there's a greater, you know, communities are greater than the sum of their parts. So hmm. things like, you know, we talked about facilitation before. Yeah. Uh, how do you account for that? Or, defensive guilds and plant communities. Right, so the question is about immersion properties and, and um, well, the, you mentioned facilitation and that was explicitly ignored in this approach, uh, but it could be incorporated. So, but we would need to think clearly about what the functional form of that relationship is. So, classic competition theory has been going back to the 60s and so the theory of limiting similarity gives us a framework for that. The idea that there's competitive hierarchies is possible and actually merges quite nicely with the limiting similarity framework. So what we would need to do is think about how trait differences might look in a mutualistic framework. Um, so having these, comp having these coefficients be positive interactions and not negative interactions. But we need to think about what that function would look like. And we, we have thought about it, and it's on our list of things to do. Um, but we would then need to, um, we haven't solved that problem. So, I don't know, it doesn't, well, there's a lot of math, yeah. Thank so goodness for good smart postdocs. Sorry? If you don't get positive interactions, when you do this? No, they're all, they're all this, this framework um, forces them all to be competitive. Yeah, we could allow that, um, the interactions to go negative, which would make it a positive interaction, but the functional form doesn't make sense for us in a mutualistic framework. We, we can't wrap our heads around that quite yet, but it's definitely important, and we haven't quite gotten there. Dan. As a community ecologist, do you lose sleep over thinking that animals and pathogens are irrelevant? <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> Never. <laughs> um, so are animals and pathogens irrelevant? Um, absolutely not. And um, we've stayed within one trophic level for simplicity only. Um, and there's a lot of thing. There's a lot of factors that we'd love to incorporate into the prediction of community assembly, and we've we've sort of stripped it down to its fundamental features of species pools, traits, and how these are filtered by the environment, and how we can maybe c estimate some competitive interactions. Um, and then it's already gotten kind of unwieldy, and s the, the model itself. And so the amount of data that we need to actually estimate these models is, is, is enormous. Um, not to say that those are unimportant, but we just haven't thought about them yet. I lose a sleep over other things. <laughs> Yeah. Um, for your models where you're looking at um, tree species, are you looking at seedling traits or mm. immature trees? Great. Chain, you know, I can imagine the ranking even between species changes from seedlings to... Yeah. Yeah. So we, I have compared, uh, well, to answer your question directly about um, did we measure adult tree traits or versus juvenile tree traits, in that um, study we, we measured adult tree traits. So, and you can imagine bark thickness, um, we estimated as a function of size, so we standardized it to size. So bark thickness was almost independent of size, it was sort of an average um, bark thickness per diameter, um, and uh, which is scalable. Um, but wood density we measured on cores uh, that we extracted from mature trees. Um, we have done some comparisons of, of 
of seedling traits to mature tree traits, and they're they're correlated. Um, but sometimes trait correlations disappear with ontogeny and sometimes they become stronger. So it is complex as you uh, would expect them to be. But on, in general, if you're an aspen, you're going to have low, low wood density when you're young and when you're old. And if you're an oak, you're going to have high wood density when you're a seedling versus an old. So the big differences remain. Yes? Um, so from like a grassland standpoint too, you're talking about this idea of using this, applying it in invasive settings. So you mentioned cheatgrass is there. Any concern that if you were to really look at a functional group of a system that was great at combating one invasive, that it might make it more susceptible to invasive, other invasives that yield other modes of invasion and what that could do to the system community? Are you accounting for that anyway? Great question. So the question is about uh, each invader is different and distinct and different community trait profiles might be good at repelling one invader but may not, but it may encourage other invaders. Um, so when de designing uh, a, uh, these species assemblages, we, we focused on cheatgrass, but we didn't think explicitly about cheatgrass, but we thought more generally that um, we could leverage um, decades of theory and empirical data on the fact that um, some systems are, uh, the, the stablest systems in these, in these type of prairie ecosystems um, are, and the species that maintain stability are those that can draw the resources down and um, repel species that require high amounts of resources. So we focused on that, um, but we thought about when in this in this grassland experiment there are two options for invaders. There's cheatgrass which is present in the landscape and then there's Dalmatian toad flax and they are very different species. Uh, they have very different root systems, uh, you know, very different longevities, uh, different life histories, so absolutely um, it matters. And if we want to, we decided against down that line area because I think that's a harder species to deal with from a biotic standpoint. Um, can we resist invasion of, of Dalmatian toad flax? Um, so we picked cheatgrass because it has a lot of relevance for, for rangeland ecology um, at, throughout the West. So. Um, but that's a, I mean, it's a great point that each, each, uh, we're focusing on cheatgrass, and, but we don't know, we don't think, I, actually, I don't think we can resist, we've talked about this a lot with Dana, we probably can't resist in Dalmatian toad flax invasion with the way we've achieved our assemblages, but this below ground vegetative reproduction, if you can vegetate below, uh, reproduce below ground vegetatively, that might be, um, the best way of repelling Dalmatian toad flax. So it's a great question. Okay, let's thank Daniel again for coming. Thank you.